My name is Candice and I'm a member of Jewish Voice for Peace New York City. Uh, thank you Hannah, Sarah, and Thomas for being here tonight and thank you to the First Unitarian Congregational Society for hosting us in this great space. For the last 10 years, campaigns for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel have been some of the most impactful means to challenge Israeli apartheid and change the discourse in this country. It is precisely because of this momentum in the BDS movement that Zionist organizations are running scared and doing everything in their power to stop this movement. Nowhere is that, is that more apparent than in New York City. New Yorkers against the Cornell Technion partnership were not allowed to speak at a Manhattan Community Board's public meeting being deemed the face of anti-Semitism last March. Legislation that targets the American Studies Association over its decision to boycott Israel passed in the New York Senate last year. Although the legislation was halted in the assembly, many, many similar bills appeared across the country. When Brooklyn College hosted an event around BDS, BDS with Judith Butler and Omar Barghouti, New, New York City public officials tried to cancel it. Despite these challenges with both our politicians and Zionist organizations, there is no doubt that the Palestine Solidarity Movement is growing in this country and that BDS campaigns are starting to have significant victories. Just this year, the Presbyterian Church divested from companies profiting from Israel's occupation. JVP's chapter in Durham was able to cancel a city contract with G4S. The ASA and the Association for Asian American Studies endorsed BDS, as well as the numerous university student bodies passing divestment resolutions. These are just a few examples, and of course, we'll hear more about those challenges and opportunities from our speakers tonight. Before I formally introduce our speakers, I want to take a moment to talk about Jewish Voice for Peace, and specifically the work we are doing in New York. Jewish Voice for Peace is a diverse and democratic community of activists with 40 chapters across the United States. JVP seeks to end the occupation of Palestine and realize a just and peaceful future for Israelis and Palestinians. JVP supports nonviolent efforts here and in Israel-Palestine to end Israel's occupation, expand human and civil rights, and implement a U.S. policy based on international law and democracy. Jewish Voice for Peace is proud to be a part of the global Palestinian-led boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement to end Israeli human rights violations. Our chapter is embarking on a new divestment campaign, and we are excited to learn from the experiences of our speakers to make this campaign as, as successful as possible. So now to introduce our speakers, we are excited to have Hannah Mermelstein here from Adala, New York, Sarah Ali from Brooklyn College Students for Justice in Palestine, and Thomas Cox from Brooklyn for Peace and the Park Slope Food Co-op members for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. So the way this panel is going to work is each speaker is going to speak for 20 minutes. Hannah is going to start and speak more generally about BDS. Then Sarah is going to speak about campus BDS and other things like that. And then Thomas is going to speak more specifically about the Park Slope Food Co-op BDS and what's going on there. So Hannah Mermelstein, Mermelstein sorry, is a school librarian and Palestinian solidarity activist in Brooklyn, New York. She has led more than 30 delegations to Palestine and is active with Adullah New York, the New York Campaign for the Boycott of Israel, and li librarians and archivists with Palestine. So we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, so I'm happy to be here to discuss BDS, especially during Israeli apartheid week. Um, to say something about IAW, Israeli apartheid week, it started in Toronto in 2005 and has since spread around the world. The stated aim is to educate people about the nature of Israel as an apartheid system and to build boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns as part of a growing global BDS movement. So this is a very appropriate event to happen this week. Um, first, a little about myself. I started doing work in Palestine in 2003. It was the height of the Second Intifada, and I was learning things that were turning my world upside down as an American Jew who had grown up as a liberal Zionist. And I decided I had to go see for myself. So I joined the International Women's Peace Service, and I worked in the North Central West Bank, mostly in rural areas, accompanying farmers to their olive groves when they were threatened by Israeli soldiers and settlers, and when Israel started building the apartheid wall, supporting protests against that. I continued to go back and forth with IWPS for years, and also started leading delegations. And for a while, I did a lot of public speaking in the US, and at the end of each event, I would feel the responsibility to give people something to do some hope and a way to be involved. So I would say, go see for yourself, or read more about it, or talk to your friends, or talk to your congressperson. 
And I had some hope in this, but I wasn't entirely convinced myself. So when the BDS call came out, I considered it a gift to all of us trying to work in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. Now, I know that the significance of the BDS movement lies not in the fact that an American Jewish activist feels it's a gift to her, but this was my entry point. And so I want to say a little bit more about the background and significance of the BDS movement, and then I'll talk a bit about my own work with Adala New York. So in 2004, Palestinian academics and cultural workers put out a call for an academic and cultural boycott of Israeli institutions. The same year, the International Court of Justice declared the wall Israel was building in the West Bank illegal. Exactly one year after that, um, after that court decision, when it had not been enforced by national or international bodies, 171 Palestinian civil society organizations called for a comprehensive boycott of Israel until it meets three demands. One, ending Israel's occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall. Two, equal rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel. And three, right of return for Palestinian refugees. Since 2005, many more Palestinian organizations have joined the call, as have organizations around the world. And the call was important for several reasons. I already mentioned I felt it was useful to international activists. Finally, we had a concrete action that we could take and build campaigns around, a request that came directly from Palestinians and that was flexible in its execution. It's always hard to answer the question, what do Palestinians want? Which Palestinians? No group is monolithic. But this comes as close to a request from the Palestinian people as you can get. It's a rights-based rather than solution-based movement. So even among the Palestinian signatories, there are institutions that support a one-state solution and those that support a two-state solution. There are Palestinian organizations in the West Bank, in Gaza, inside 48 or Israel, and in the diaspora. And the demands themselves, the three demands, reframe the discussion so we don't only think about Palestinians as those living in the West Bank and Gaza, or Palestine as only that small fraction of a whole. Israel has tried very hard and largely successfully to divide Palestinian people into small disparate groups by giving them different labels, different IDs, different rights, and the BDS movement brings them together. So BDS is not a solution, but it is the best strategy I know to move us toward a just solution. It's important to note that BDS is a tactic, not a dogma. So what does this mean? First, it's a response to anyone who says, why boycott Israel? What about fill in the blank with any country committing atrocities? But nobody in the BDS movement says Israel is the only country in the world that deserves to be boycotted. Most countries, and certainly most companies, probably deserve to be boycotted from a moral standpoint. But BDS is a tactic. Palestinians have called for it, and it's effective. We know it's effective because the Israeli government spends millions of dollars to try to fight it. And we can also point to specific successes. Um, which you already mentioned some of, but um, here are a few. So Veolia has lost billions of dollars in contracts because it provides services to Israeli settlements. Dock workers from San Francisco to South Africa have refused to unload Israeli cargo, especially during, during Israeli bombing campaigns. Artists from Elvis Costello to Cat Power to Snoop Dogg have canceled performances in Israel. Just a couple weeks ago, close to 1,000 British artists declared their support for cultural boycott. People like Roger Waters, Angela Davis, Arundhati Roy, Judith Butler, and Sarah Shulman have all spoken up in favor of BDS. Um, a number of academic associations have put out statements supporting academic boycott. Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and El Salvador all withdrew their ambassadors during Israel's assault on Gaza last summer. SodaStream stock continues to plummet. Just in the past month, we've seen a number of successes on campuses both in the US and in the UK. On February 8th, the University of California Student Association voted overwhelmingly to divest from companies violating human rights in the occupied territories. On February 17th, the undergraduate senate at Stanford University voted to do the same. On February 27th, just last week, more than 2,000 students, faculty, and staff at the School of Oriental and African Studies in Britain cast their votes, and 73% of them voted to boycott Israeli academic institutions. So Israel is losing the moral authority it relies on to continue its policies with impunity. We even see mainstream media criticizing Netanyahu now, albeit, as you said, more because he's pompous and defying Obama than because of any of his policies towards Palestinians. But with all the successes we've had, there are also challenges. People have now heard of BDS, and people who want to do something about Palestine are often excited to join the BDS movement. 
but not everybody does the background work necessary to find out what the BDS movement actually calls for. During crisis times, like Israel's bombing of Gaza, there are always increased calls for boycott, but often they're not well thought out. I've seen boycott lists, for example, that include McDonald's, which is one of the only companies to have publicly refused to open a store in a settlement, and Starbucks, which has a section on their website specifically saying they do not support Israel. There are other reasons you might not want to go to McDonald's or Starbucks, but if you're specifically trying to support Palestinian rights, whoprofits.org is a good resource to find out what companies are complicit and in what ways. Um, and you can also try to find out if there are ongoing campaigns about particular products. Adele in New York, one of the groups I work with, has a flyer that's back on that table that highlights 11 companies doing business in New York and why they're boycottable. With cultural and academic boycott, there's a lot of gray area. So PACB, the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, has developed very specific guidelines that are continually updated for clarification. When people are confused about the guidelines or don't know of their existence, they sometimes call for boycotts of events that are not technically boycottable according to PACB. This doesn't mean that you can't protest. PACB makes it clear that if something's happening that you find offensive, by all means you should protest, but it should only be associated with BDS if it meets those specific criteria. And vice versa, not everything that is technically boycottable actually makes a good campaign target. So there can be a tension sometimes between having a mass movement, a popular movement, and being informed enough to adhere to the specificities of the BDS call from Palestine and to, strength, to think strategically. The group I do most of my BDS work with is Adala New York, the New York Campaign for the Boycott of Israel. One of our most successful campaigns has been around Lev Levayev, the diamond manufacturer and settlement builder. When he opened a store in Madison Ave in 2007, Adala New York was there. I wasn't involved yet, I wasn't living in New York at the time, but the story goes that we showed up to the store's grand opening, which Susan Sarandon was attending, and the next day the New York Post had a headline saying, will Susan Sarandon cross a picket line if there are diamonds on the other side? So already we had press, but we had also done our background work. We chose Leviev as a target for a number of reasons. His egregious practices were clear, from Angola, where he exploits workers in the diamond mines, to New York City, where he was engaged in typical slumlord behavior, to Palestine, where he built settlements. In fact, it was our colleagues in Jayus and Belin, two villages who have long resisted the wall and settlement confiscation of their land, who first asked us to look into Levayev, since he's building on their land. So we also have this direct, direct connection to Palestine. I don't think that's always necessary for a BDS campaign. I think having the call from Palestine can be enough to keep us accountable, but I do think having the relationship certainly helps to ground our work. Over the years, we've engaged in the Leviev campaign in many ways. The most public face has always been our creative actions in front of his store, which used to happen regularly three times a year, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, and Christmas. We would also do other demonstrations at events Leviev was sponsoring or somehow connected to. We still do our Christmas and Hanukkah caroling every year, which is lots of fun for us, if nothing else. We've also done a lot of behind-the-scenes work to sustain the campaign. Because one important thing about a campaign against a diamond manufacturer is that it is not primarily a consumer campaign. On its surface, it looks like one. We go to his store, we try to disrupt his business. But how many of us buy diamonds on a regular basis? So we went for his connections. And this is something we've consistently done in our campaigns um, since then as well. We saw on his website, for example, a celebrity section. So we reached out to the celebrities featured, and while we did not hear directly back from them, the celebrity section disappeared shortly thereafter. We noticed that he was boasting about his donations to Oxfam and UNICEF, so we contacted them. UNICEF publicly severed ties with Leviev, and Oxfam said that they have never and would never take money from Leviev. We've also worked with allies throughout the world, and have seen the Norwegian, Dutch, and Swedish governments divest from Africa Israel, Leviev's main company. Africa Israel itself has announced twice now that they will stop building settlements. Turns out it might not be 100% accurate, but the fact that we're making them say that is quite a success. For the past couple years, Leviev has been secondary for us as we've focused more on other campaigns. We've done a lot of cultural boycott work, which I also think has been really successful. And I think one of the main accomplishments of cultural boycott work has actually been just to push the discourse. After one of our first cultural boycott actions, it was a protest of Batsheva Dance Company, there were articles written about it that asked whether boycotting art and culture was ever okay. 
And by doing that, they sort of bypassed and took for granted questions about whether Israel is committing abuses against Palestinians, and even about whether boycott is an appropriate tool. It was like, yeah, Israel's bad, and yeah, you can boycott, but should you really be boycotting art? So that was huge, that shifting of the discourse. But Sheva has since returned to New York many times, and each time they know they're going to be protested, often with creative song and dance of our own outside. Same with the Israel Ballet, Israel Philharmonic Orchestra, Idan Reichel, and more. We've also focused on international artists going to perform in Israel, particularly when there's some New York connection. When Leonard Cohen was planning to go to Tel Aviv a few years ago, we scheduled a protest of his concert in New York, asking him not to go, and we worked with others along his tour route to do the same. His management actually reached out to us for a meeting. I wasn't part of that meeting, but apparently we were offered free tickets to his show to prove how much he likes peace. We told him that's not the issue that normalizing apartheid is, and he tried to say some of his proceeds would go to Palestinians. He set up a fund through Amnesty International. We and others contacted Amnesty, and they withdrew their support. He then tried to give money to Palestinian organizations directly, and the Palestinian organizations refused the money because he was performing in Israel as part of the Brand Israel campaign. So he still did perform, but all of the articles said things like, despite protest, Leonard Cohen performs in Tel Aviv. So although he performed, all of those other things, I think, can be considered major successes. One campaign that was a bit harder for us was the TIA Cref We Divest campaign. JVP and many other groups worked for several years and are still working to some degree on getting TIA Cref, the largest pension fund in the US, to divest from companies profiting from occupation. While the campaign has had several successes, we had challenges trying to make a strong local campaign out of it. It's much easier to focus on a company than a pension fund. When focusing on TIA Cref itself, it means we're working with constituencies that we're not necessarily part of. So we had some meetings, for example, with faculty at CUNY, and some were very interested, but ultimately it was something they would have had to take up, not something that we from the outside as a community group could push. The whole campaign has actually started to focus more on the individual companies in the TIA Cref portfolio than on TIA Cref itself. And to that end, we're now working on a SodaStream campaign. I won't say much about SodaStream now since it's in its early stages for us, and I think Tom will be talking more about it also maybe with Park Slope Food Co-op. Um, but look for some creative Adela New York actions in the near future, hopefully. So challenges, being very diligent about adhering to the BDS call, being strategic, mobilizing people in local campaigns, and knowing our own role and limitations as a community group. Successes, background research, looking at our target's connections to other potential allies, and above all, creative action. Thank you.